The old saying goes that you're known by the company you keep. There's perhaps no figure in American politics who proves that adage more than Huma Abedin, a woman you've seen everywhere but have only really known through two of the most high-profile politicians and political events of the last decade. We've known Abedin as the woman who's been by Hillary Clinton's side for decades, when Clinton was first lady, U.S. senator, secretary of state, and eventually presidential candidate. Aberdeen has been Clinton's right-hand woman, a key figure involved in every aspect of Clinton's political journey, quietly, on the side. We've also known Aberdeen as the Muslim woman who married the rising Jewish congressman Anthony Weiner, Anthony Weiner, a man who would eventually be caught in several sexting scandals and would later land in prison after pleading guilty to sending obscene material to a minor. It was in the midst of Weiner's second sexting episode and his ill-timed mayoral run in 2013 that the world finally heard Aberdeen's voice in defense of her then husband. Our marriage, like many others, has had its ups and its downs. It took a lot of work and a whole lot of therapy to get to a place where I could forgive Anthony. The world would get an even closer look at the woman behind the political curtain through her husband's words in the 2016 documentary that followed his run for mayor. Did Huma want you to get back into politics? Well, she did. Uh, she did. She was very eager to get her life back that I had taken from her. To clean up the mess that I had made running for mayor was the straightest line to do it. Wiener's scandals, the mess that he made, wouldn't be the only uncomfortable topic that brought Aberdeen into the limelight. For someone who so seemingly wanted to stay behind the scenes, her decision to continue her marriage with him would later force her into the center of perhaps the greatest political upset of our lifetime. During the investigation into Wiener's next sexting scandal, this time with a minor, one of his laptops was taken in as part of the criminal investigation. Emails that Aberdeen had sent as an aide to Clinton from his laptop were discovered reigniting Clinton's email controversy months after it had been closed. FBI Director James Comey reopened the investigation 11 days before the 2016 presidential election, a decision many have argued helped Donald Trump defeat Clinton in a super close race. So what does a figure who was at once behind the scenes and front and center have to say about all this? Homer Aberdeen's out with a book, both and a life in many worlds. It tells the story of power and politics, of Anthony Weiner and Hillary Clinton, and also herself, in her own words. Homer Aberdeen joins me now. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Congratulations on the book. I know it must have been very hard to write. You have described yourself as the mysterious Muslim aide whom everyone saw but no one heard, the invisible body who always followed Hillary Clinton, which in many ways you were, and yet now you've gone almost to the other extreme, writing this fascinating but very personal book. Why, and why now? Mandy, first of all, I have to say, I'm so happy to be talking to you. I've been looking forward to this conversation, and I'm only sorry we're not doing it in person, but thank you for having me on your show. Um, I, I am. Hope, I hope the, you say in, that at the end of the conversation as well, but appreciate you being here. You know, I got some really good news just before I walked onto the set, and so I, I'm feeling uh, I, this is going to be a good conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Um, why I wrote the book now, I, uh, I've actually been asked can that question a lot us? over the last... See, I can tell you. Um, I could have written this book. I actually was listening to audio that I had not heard before that you just played before we got on. You know, look, I've been in public service for 20, 25 years. I was the invisible person behind the primary people. I prefer that space and place. Uh, I didn't intentionally step out as the limelight. And I felt, though, that for the last two decades, somebody else has been, you know, telling my story for me and writing my history. And I decided to tell my full truth. Writing the book was actually therapy, wonderful therapy. I enjoyed the writing process. And I'm really proud of my story. I'm the daughter of two immigrants, came to this country, an Indian father, a Pakistani mother. They gave up everything to, you know, on a dream to come study in this country. They were Fulbright scholars. Education was a religion. And I was born in this country. And I've always been conscious of the extraordinary privilege, all the sacrifices my parents made to give me the life that I've had. And I hope that they'll look back and be proud of the work that I've done. Yes. 
I mean, what you've achieved and your backstory is indeed astonishing, and I urge people to read it and find out more about, especially your childhood growing up in Saudi Arabia and what you've achieved in the United States. You mentioned the writing the book was like therapy. There's a lot of self-criticism in the book, a lot. A lot of criticism of your soon-to-be ex-husband, former Congressman Anthony Weiner. But basically, no criticism of Hillary Clinton at all, I noticed. What do you think we learn that's new about her from your book, about her flaws or her mistakes while you were at her side for over 20 years? You know, I tell the story in the book about campaigning for her in 2016 and walking into an event. And, you know, I, I am doing the thing now with you that terrifies me the most, which is speaking and being in public. Um, and uh, in 2016, when they sent me out on the road, I would go to these events and talk about her and the way I knew her. And people would come up to me and say, this is astonishing. Why doesn't she, you know, these stories are incredible. Why doesn't she talk this way about herself? the way you speak about her, and I always, you know, said then, and I believe it now, she never believed it was about her. It was always about other people. I try in this book, as much as, um, you know, I, I, people might take away different things from it, but I don't try to tell stories about Hillary or Anthony or President Obama or anybody else I uh, worked with or was with. I just show what it was like, and I hope I have done justice to that experience, taking people into the room, what it was like traveling to Iraq on these congressional delegations and meeting with Iraqi women, what yeah. it was like going to these refugee camps in Macedonia, what it was like on the campaign trail, that feeling of walking into a gymnasium or a town hall, the goosebumps, that feeling of hope, the, the dreams, the hopes of, and fears of people that you carry with you, that you meet, it's something you can't explain unless you've really been in it, but it's... So um, you know, I've tried to do that as it relates to my relationship with her and how she is as a person. So it wasn't just your personal relationship. You had a very political relationship. You, people don't realize you were the vice chair of the 2016 campaign. I wonder, as you were writing this book and thinking about the past, were you able to reflect on one of any of the big errors, the biggest mistakes of the 2016 campaign were? Well, you know, I think there's been so much, wow, I mean, so much, uh, you know, uh, sp not speculation, but reviews and commentary about what happened in 2016. I think those of us who are on that campaign are incredibly proud of the campaign that we participated in. The mission, the candidate, it was all the right thing for the country. Mandy, I get up every single day and I think of all the things that would have benefited this country if Hillary Clinton had been elected in 2016. That is how I look at it. I think hindsight being 2020 shows that the external forces that worked against us, everything from sexism to a foreign government intervention to an FBI director making a breaking news revelation 11 days before the election says a lot. The fact that Hillary Clinton did as well as she did in some cases is a miracle because the, the forces against so her were actually quite, quite challenging. I, I completely agree with you about the external forces. I don't deny the sexism. I don't deny the Comey role at all. Uh, there's an ongoing debate even today on what was the Russian involvement. Um, but accepting all of that, can we also accept in hindsight that maybe it wasn't the wisest decision to put up against the most unpopular candidate in history, Donald J. Trump, the second most unpopular candidate in history? Well, I think you should ask the American people. Three million more people voted for her than for him. And she was chosen. She was, we live in a democracy. And she won the primary. So are you suggesting, wait, now I want to ask you questions. Um, are, are you suggesting that uh, the party should Please, have nominated somebody else? I, I, I hope that when people close this book, that part of one of their takeaways, I hope, now I know a lot of people aren't going to agree with this, but that they will take away that she would have been an extraordinary president. I believe, and it's not just what I believe, President Obama said this at the 2016 convention, she yeah. was the most qualified I candidate to run for president in this country, full stop, period, full stop, period. No, I mean, I guess it's a separate debate we don't have time for. I guess people would argue that the field was cleared for her many years before. People didn't run because people thought she would run away with it, and then she didn't. But again, an argument for another day. Let me ask you about something you write in your book. You called your husband uh, after James Comey announced he was reopening the investigation into Clinton's emails. And you said, according to the book, quote, Anthony, if she loses this election, it will be because of you 
and me, quite a dramatic statement. But then you write near the end of the book, referring to James Comey, one man's decision to play God forever changed the course of history. How did you ultimately come to see Comey as the one to blame for all this? And do you no longer think you and your husband were to blame at all for this loss, even unwittingly? I wonder, does that weigh on you today or not, five years later? Well, 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 Mehdi, if you read my book, I take people through. I mean, it, as I was doing, uh, as I was writing this book, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of my colleagues who was working with me on it said they, they looked back and one of the most common headlines about me in the period of time that I was married to Anthony was, what is wrong with her and what is she thinking? And it is why I put exactly what I was thinking. I took people exactly into my heart and mind every step of the way, starting in 2011, when I woke up at Buckingham Palace, where I was blissfully married to what I believed was the man of my dreams. I was carrying his child. I was not even 12 weeks pregnant. And to go from having this magical life destroyed, living in shock and trauma and betrayal. And I think, you know, if you don't live in this world where you have somebody you care about that is dealing with either addiction or compulsive behavior, then you don't understand. And you are lucky because you are untouched. And for me, it took a very long time to understanding what I was dealing with. I was very good at compartmentalizing. So to take us to that day, 11 days before the election, of course I felt as though we were responsible, as if I were responsible. And as I write in the book, I didn't even think I deserved to feel anything because feeling felt selfish. That's how hard it was. That's how destroyed I was inside. And it took me to a very, very low place. I mean, uh, as I write in the book, if you get to that part of the book, things got much worse for me after uh, the 2016 election. I had the lowest low that yes. I could possibly imagine. And my faith saved me. My family saved me. But I did have to forgive myself. I did have to not carry the burden, not carry this weight, because really, it was killing me. At all the anger, all the bitterness, and I had so to do the hardest thing, which was, you know, go through the process that I went through. And that is how I'm on the other side and having this conversation that I'm having with you today. So I want to talk about your faith and what you just mentioned, but just sticking with your marriage since you raised the issue, the marriage to Anthony Weiner, which who you're almost, I believe, now done divorcing. He's now on the sex offenders list. What happened in your marriage is between both of you. But he was a public figure, of course, running for office. And your critics wonder why you encouraged a man like that, who had already resigned from Congress in disgrace, to run again for mayor of New York. And then when he's caught in another sexting scandal, in the middle of that race in 2013, you famously come out and defend him. I, I want us to have a watch briefly of that clip. Have a watch. Anthony's made some horrible mistakes, both before he resigned from Congress and after. But I do very strongly believe that that is between us and our, our marriage. We discussed all of this before Anthony decided he would run for mayor. So really what I want to say is I love him, I have forgiven him, I believe in him, and as we have said from the beginning, we are moving forward. Your critics, Homar, would say that what you did there in that moment was wrong. You were enabling a man who clearly had a problem, who had already been caught doing inappropriate things, and misleading New Yorkers. What do you say in hindsight? Well, you know, in speaking of hindsight, I think a lot of people look at my relationship with Anthony from a 2021 perspective. In real time, in 2011, when the story first broke, people were shocked. People also, this was a bit of a, you know, a new, we were in a whole new digital world. Um, you know, uh, the, the entities by which he was able to um, delve into this behavior hadn't existed before Facebook and Twitter and all of these things that uh, made these things accessible to him. People didn't, you know, I did encourage him to run for mayor in 2013. I, the clips that you've played are the first time I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing most of them. I did encourage him to run in 2013. And why? Because when we went into therapy, I talk about going to Texas after it had happened. I was in such shock. I didn't understand. Anthony was my first love. He was the first man I'd ever been with. He was my first Valentine's date. I did not understand that this was behavior for somebody who spent all of her life, adult life, childhood life, in control. I didn't believe I couldn't understand how somebody could not have control of certain things. And I absolutely believed that Anthony could knock off the behavior after 2011. And as I detail in the book, great thought and research went into 
his even deciding to run for mayor and all of the focus groups that he had undertaken that I had witnessed, we were all in shock that most New Yorkers arguably believed that he was a good congressman. Everything I had been taught in therapy was that, yes, people have problems, but they still have to participate in society. So why did I stand to that press conference, which I still don't apologize for today, is I did believe it was incumbent upon me to explain why it encouraged him to run. And that's why I stood at that podium. Now, in hindsight, was it a mistake for him to run? Absolutely. But I did have to take responsibility for encouraging him to do it. You say in the book that the pressure and, I guess, humiliation that your husband put you through made you even consider suicide, but it was your faith that got you through it, as you mentioned a moment ago. Talk to me about that faith, because you are the daughter of two Muslim scholars, Muslim intellectuals, people don't realize that. And of course, you were famously smeared by the Republican Party, by members of the Republican Party, I should say, Michelle Bachman and others, in 2012 for your faith. You were accused of being some kind of sleeper agent for the Muslim Brotherhood inside the United States government, and John McCain came to your defense. Talk to me about your faith then and during all of these episodes. You know, when I was two years old, my father was diagnosed with renal failure, and he was told he had five to ten years to live. And it's one of the first lines I wrote in my book. My father was told he was dying, and so he went out and he lived. He was my age. He was 46 when he got that diagnosis. We got on a plane. We went to Saudi Arabia for a one-year sabbatical that turned into many more years. But faith was core to our life. Faith, anybody who's a Muslim knows that it's a whole entire way of life. I grew up in Saudi Arabia, was privileged to be surrounded by a community and a family that I found very supportive. But my father's entire life, life's work was about exploring Muslim minority conditions around the world and constantly seeking conversation with the other. So when he would try and go, we would, he would take us to you know, monasteries in Greece to talk to Christians and Jews, and fellow Muslims would say, don't go in to have conversations where even angels fear to tread. And he was fearless about it. And I think that um, sense of, of uh, confidence in our faith, my parents taught us by example. They didn't force us to do anything. It was by our own choice. And I think that's what grounded me, landed me in the United States. It's why when I walked into the White House in 1996, I had a confidence. I proudly shared my faith traditions, and it was embraced and in the Clinton administration and in the Obama administration. And so in 2012, when Michelle Bachman and these other Republican Congress people sent this letter, smearing not just me and my family, but other high-level Muslims serving in government, patriots serving in government. It was shocking and devastating, especially when you understand our community and your name and reputation means so much. And it had consequences on our government. Hillary went to Egypt as Secretary of State, and we were in a meeting, and the man said, I'm not sure we can trust your country because of your aide who's advising you, who we don't trust. Um, and uh, it was probably the worst attack. I've been through some challenges, and that was the worst, because it was about my family, and especially my parents, and my father, who was not even alive to defend himself. And when John McCain and Barack Obama defended me and my family, it was so amazing, but it wasn't just about me. And I knew that even then, they were standing up for the values and principles upon which this country was founded. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.